This video is part of the Commercial Building Electrical Design Series. We're continuing to look at power distribution design. Under that, we, uh, we've gone through basic materials and now we're looking at different types of gear. So today we're looking at uh, grouped gear. So just to keep up with our progression of things, um, we have talked about uh, delivery systems. We still continue to go through different types of materials. And like I said, we're into switch gear now. We talked about individual gear, disconnects and breakers last time. And so now we want to extend that to grouped gear. So first we want to talk about panel boards. So panel boards are basically enclosures that house circuit breakers fed from a common bus that are utilized to feed branch circuits. So in a sense, this is a box that contains various numbers of the application of the tap rule from the central bus. Circuits that feed lighting, receptacles, and other miscellaneous loads typically originate from a circuit breaker located inside a panel. Panel boards, or panels as they're more commonly called, can be either single phase or three phase and come in various standard sizes. In general, the standard sizes that you'll see in commercial construction are usually 100 amp. Uh, you can have 225 or sometimes 250 amp, 400 amp, 600 amp, 800 amp, and 1200 amp. So with panel boards, there are two major categories of panels which are, you can have a main breaker board or a main lug only board. The main breaker type of panel has one large main breaker sized according to the rating of the panel, or it could be less than that. Uh, the size of the main breaker must be coordinated with the size of the feeder wires feeding the panel, as well as to ensure that the conductors and the panel bus are adequately protected. Basically, the only time a main breaker is required by code is when there is no other overcurrent protection protecting the feeders and the panel bus. This most commonly occurs when the panel is being fed from the secondary side of a transformer and or from a tap rule situation. If the panel is being fed from a circuit breaker from another panel or if it is fed from or through a fuse disconnect, then a main breaker is not required, although you can still have one. Uh, in this case, the panel will have main lugs attached directly to the bus in the panel, which will connect to the incoming feeder. Hence the name main lug only. A main breaker can still be installed in a panel if it is not technically required, but care should be taken to properly coordinate the main breaker with overcurrent protection upstream to ensure proper layers of protection are in place. So here is an example uh, of a panel that has a main breaker. So you see the feeder coming in here and it goes through this larger breaker first. And so this is your main breaker and then it goes from this breaker to these lugs. So if the breaker wasn't here and the feeders came in and just landed straight on these lugs, these would be main lugs. So this would be your main lug only panel. Incidentally, you see in here we have a, a gutter uh, over here to the side and they are feeding some uh, instrumentation or controls over here. If you see this, or you might hear people refer to a marshalling panel, that's what this is. So when they have a panel right next to a panel that's used to uh, distribute the, the power directly into like circuit boards or something like that, that's called a marshalling panel there. And then you see here, they have another gutter where for some reason they've brought their ground over here. So they'll be making their ground connections here. Uh, this is usually done if they have like an isolated ground, uh, they will do that sometimes. So. So this is a pretty good example of some different attributes you might see with a panel. And then here are your, your branch circuit breakers. It's usually like single pole 20 amps or, or whatever you need there. And then you also have your neutral connection coming in right there. So here's one with the cover on. And again, you can usually tell if it's a main breaker panel. So it'll have this very large breaker, usually on the top or the bottom where the feeder comes in. So without pulling the panel cover off, I can tell this is more than likely a main breaker panel. And then that feeds the bus here that's using the branch circuit breakers coming off there. So when it's determined that a main breaker will be required, it is highly practical to size the panel to at least the next standard size of the connected load and size the main breaker in accordance with the panel size. So for instance, if the design load on a panel is 230 amps, uh, it's practical to specify a 400 amp panel with a 400 amp main breaker. Some might argue that it would be sufficient to design towards a 250 amp or 300 amp main breaker. 
While this is an option, the reality is that even in these scenarios, a 400 amp panel will have to be utilized uh, because there really is no 300 amp panel and it'll be equipped with a, small, a smaller main breaker. For most cases, the cost savings on downsizing the feeder and the main breaker to match the load does not typically save that much money, especially if the project is going out for bid. So on bid day, it about all counts the same. So you're not really saving any money, you're just limiting your capacity. So this being the case, since a 400 amp panel will be installed anyway, one might as well size the feeder and the main breaker to match so as to have the potential to fully utilize the panel if need be in the future. One final aspect or option available on panels that is worth mentioning here is the lug options. Per code, for most applications, the most circuit breakers that can be fed from one physical panel is 42. Uh, for mechanical panels, this can be larger, but for many applications, this is adequate, but there are some instances where more are needed. This being the case, a second panel could be installed that is fed from a new feeder, but this is more often than not impractical and costly. One option that the designer has in this situation is to install a new panel, but have it fed from either feed through lugs or sub fed lugs from the original panel. In the case of feed through lugs, additional lugs are installed on the other side of the panel bus so that the conductors can be connected here and run to the lugs of the second panel. In a sense, this, is in a sense, this basically just extends the bus into the second panel. So here's an example of some uh, panels that are, they ha it has a main breaker, but it also has feed through lugs. So you can see here, the, the main incoming service comes in here, comes through this main breaker, and then these are your branch circuit breakers. And so they obviously didn't have enough branch circuit breakers. So what they did was they set a second panel, they put lugs on the other side of the bus and disconnected wires to go through here and come through and connect to this bus. So this is basically just extending this bus into the next panel. So code-wise, this is really all one panel. This main breaker here is protecting all of these breakers. And you can see the busing and the, and the, and the feeders are all sized the same for the same amp amperage of the breaker. So you're just getting more branch circuit breaker um, space by doing this. In the case of subfed lugs, there are two sets of lugs connected to the bus, with one being used to connect to the first panel bus, and the second set of lugs are used to connect from this point to the second panel bus. In this case, the input to the panel is what we call double lugged, and you can do this to a transformer as well, to allow a feeder for the second panel. So when we double lug a transformer, we can feed two loads from the same transformer, same type of, same concept. So in each of these cases, the panels must have the same rating and the same size conductor must be used to feed both panels. These types of installations are typically referred to as double section, two panels, or triple section, three panel, panel boards. So here's an example. It's not in a panel board, but it's in a disconnect. I guess this is a small panel application, like you would see, like they said here, at a well house or some uh, exterior load. So you can see they come in here. This is where the main would connect. You come to this disconnect, which could be fed through these lugs to something else. But then you come off this double lug over to this where you could put some circuit breakers. So this is a subfed lug or a double lugged uh, connection right here. So here's an example of the three things we've talked about, right? So you can have each of these three panel boards. So if we come in here and we put a second set of lugs here, this is called subfed lugs. And so you come in with your incoming, this will feed these breakers, and then you connect here, which is also connected to this lug, and then feed something else downstream. Now we can have feed through lugs, where in this case, we still have our incoming feeder coming into this lug. It goes through this bus, which feeds these breakers, but then we put lugs at the end and connect and go downstream. So this is subfed lugs, this is feed through lugs. Now, if we might have a smaller panel downstream, uh, then we can use what's called a subfed breaker. So here, same thing, we come in with our conductors, hit this lug, goes through the bus, the bus feeds these breakers, and then we put more lugs in a breaker, or either maybe we might just insert a breaker if it'll fit in the panel. You have to check the manufacturer. You can set a subfed breaker, and then we come off here with something smaller. So this could be like a 225 amp panel, but we want to add a smaller 100 amp panel just to give us a few more breakers. So we'd put a 100 amp breaker and 100 amp feeder going over to that. 
So here's you know a diagrammatic look at the three scenarios we just talked about: subfed lugs, feed through lugs, and subfed breaker. So let's talk about dry type transformers. So as we've talked about briefly, transformers are a basic piece of switchgear that is used to change the voltage value of a system from one voltage to another. Most of the time a transformer is used to reduce the voltage from one value or set of values to another. The most common use is the transform is when we transform a 480 volt three phase system to a 12208 volt three phase system. Uh, but there are other uses as well. Although voltage values can be changed using transformers, the total power or KVA remains the same across the transformer minus some minor losses. So remember the KVA for three phase loads is defined uh, as the voltage multiplied by the current divided by a thousand or an equation form. Uh, it looks like this right here. KVA equals square root of three voltage times current over a thousand. Since the value of KVA must remain the same for a given transformer, if the voltage changes across the transformer, the current must change as well to keep the KVA the same. So with the voltage staying the same, as the KVA goes up, the current must go up, or KVA goes down, the current must go down across the transformer. So as evident from the equation above, the voltage and current will have an inverse proportionate relationship, i.e. as the voltage goes down, the current must proportionately go up. This is a very simple and useful concept in electrical distribution design. The basic idea in the application of this concept is that larger wire naturally costs more than smaller wire. So if a higher voltage is used, less current will be required to serve the same size KVA load. Therefore, the higher voltage, typically 480, should be used for feeders to remote panel locations. At these locations, a transformer should then be used to step down the voltage, in a sense, and increase the current to the desired voltage value, typically 12208, for use with the localized load. So this saves us some wire size and feeder size until we get to our 12208 panel need or location. While stepping voltages up or down is the primary use for transformers, it's not the only use. Another benefit of using a transformer is that it supplies a level of isolation from the rest of the distribution system. If there is a load that is producing a great deal of noise or harmonics that could be detrimental to the rest of the system, a transformer can be installed to isolate this load to provide some protection or filtration from the unwanted noise. This can be done while also changing the voltage across the transformer, but this is not required. It is possible to get a one-to-one -one transformer, that is, the input voltage and output voltage values are the same. In this case, the transformer is transparent to the feeder in terms of voltage current relationship, but it provides a desired isolation mentioned above. And so some might ask what it would be a noisy load. Some motors can be noisy, but also if you have a lot of digital uh, equipment uh, somewhere in a, in a location, uh, that digital equipment is going to produce a lot of harmonics as things are switching and they're you know, they're using uh, square wave signals or anything like that. So that can put a lot of noise back on our power line. So sometimes we might want to put an isolation transformer in there to help filter some of that out. In the event that a transformer is being, is being used to change the voltage and large harmonic loads is expected, then the designer should specify the transformer to be K-rated. So a K-rated transformer is specially designed to absorb or attenuate unwanted harmonics. This, which could cause a normal transformer to overheat. So the common rules of thumb in specifying K-rated transformers is as follows. Um, if you use like a K4-rated transformer, if you're expecting 35% of your load to be nonlinear, and again, computers can be nonlinear loads, fluorescent lighting can be nonlinear, uh, a K7-rated transformer is rated for 50% linear, 50% nonlinear. So if you think half your loads are going to be uh, nonlinear, you might want to go with the K7. A K13 rated transformer is rated for 75% linear loading. Uh, so again, this would take care of a lot of that. And then finally, a K20 rated transformer is for installations that have an unusually high har harmonic or nonlinear content. So as a designer, you know, you do need to have some knowledge of what type of loads you're serving. And many times, if we know there's a a large concentration of nonlinear loads. We might even run two separate feeders over there. One is a noisy and one is a non-noisy. And so we run all the noisy outlets to, or noisy loads to one panel, 
So if you had a lot of computer outlets that you knew were going to be used there, and then the general purpose outlets and other nonlinear, other linear loads, we'd run to another panel. So we'd run a K-rated transformer to one and a non-K-rated transformer to the other. So here's a table that kind of gives you an idea and a, you know, some guidance <clears throat> as to uh, what you might want to specify. You know, if you have electric discharge lighting like HI, HID lighting, we'll talk about that later. You might want K4. UPS with optional input filtering, K4, if you have a welder, um, induction heating, PLCs and solid state controls. Now if you move up to telecommunication equipment, so if you have a telecom room with a transformer, you're probably going to want that to be K13. Uh, UPS without filtering, uh, multi-wire receptacle circuits and general care areas of healthcare, because a lot of the healthcare equipment is, is digital now, it's computerized. Um, you get down to mainframe computer loads. You don't see those a lot anymore, but if you run across one, you're probably going to want a K20. Solid state motor drives, if you have a bank of those, you might want to feed those through a K20. Uh, and things going into critical care and hospital rooms, you know, a K20, you don't want any noise coming back on those uh, circuits there. So pretty good uh, rule of thumb here in this table of when you might want to specify what type of transformer. Next, we want to take a minute to talk quickly about motor control centers, or you might hear them referred to as MCCs. These are another piece of switch gear uh, <clears throat> that are at times uh, utilized on larger projects or projects that have a high concentration of motors in one location. An MCC is very similar to a panel board or a switchboard, except that instead of breaker spaces, it has compartments which are commonly referred to as buckets. So you might hear someone talking about a bucket in an MCC. So this is just a compartment. So the compartments are utilized to provide the overcurrent protection for a motor branch circuit along with the motor starter. So one advantage to doing this is that all of the motor controls can be located in one place, uh, which can simplify controlling these motors for various process, processes. Oftentimes these MCCs will also contain a programmable logic or PLC unit, which can be programmed to control motors and or communicate with a central control device. So here's a picture of a MCC. So you can see these are your buckets. So you can see that you have a, a way to turn this off and on, but also you have a, some type of motor control module here that you could, uh, some of them you can program right there in the bucket. Some of them they just have connections usually by ethernet or some other uh, back net connection uh, to go to some central processing area. So. Uh, again, this is a, this is an MCC, and so oftentimes in industrial applications, uh, they'll only design to the MCC and get that permitted, and then they'll come back after the building is built and signed off on, and then add their their connections from here out to the motor loads. And one reason for that is processing loads are usually exempt from being permitted, so this simplifies the permit process. So another advantage to using the MCC is in the case where there will be a large process piece of the design that might be installed later. Again, let's, as I mentioned, for most permitting agencies, the AHJ will allow for a design to stop at an MCC, knowing that the loads connected from here to the process motors is considered separate work. So this can, again, can simplify the design and the permitting phase of a project. Finally, we want to look at switchboards. <clears throat> So in general, a switchboard is a larger application of a panel board as it basically serves the same purpose in deriving and protecting larger circuits. While panel boards can be specified in total loads up to 1200 amps, that's usually as high as any manufacturer will go with what's considered a traditional panel board. Switchboards can be specified larger in this up to 4000 amps, and in some special cases even larger, but uh, we usually don't go above 4000 amps because usually the largest transformer that a utility company will want to supply you is a 2500 kVA and that's good for between 3000 and 4000 amps and so they will serve most of the time a 4000 amp board from that but uh, you probably won't have a hard time getting anything larger than that. Switchboards are also uh, equipped to house much larger circuit breakers for larger loads and feeders. Switchboards are typically only needed on larger projects with larger electrical loads and service. In these cases, the switchboard serves as the service entrance device and will many times have a main breaker for the entire facility. Unlike the panel boards, there really is no limit to the number of circuits that a switchboard can have. 
If more circuits are needed, one simply needs to add another section to the switchboard to accommodate the space needed to house the additional breakers. The only constraint in this case is to make sure that there is adequate space and clearance for the switchboard as these devices can be quite large. So this is what a typical switchboard would look like. And actually this is a special case of a switchboard that you'll see in some larger facilities. It's double-ended switchboard. So what that means is you'd actually probably come in with two services, one here and one here. And then this breaker would be your tiebreaker. So that's just in case you lose one service or the other for a critical facility. You can close this breaker and feed, you know, one side of the, both sides of the board from one feeder. And so from here, the, the one service you know, goes this direction and feeds the loads on this side. And this service would go this way and feed the loads on this side. So one last thing we want to look at in terms of gear is that there are some requirements for clearances that we have to observe. And so these are defined in the National Electrical Code in Table 110.26A1. And so they give three conditions, right? So one condition is you have exposed live parts and insulated material. Condition two is you have exposed live parts and grounded parts or material on the other side. And finally, you have exposed live parts with potentially exposed live parts on the other side. So, you know, if you're at your back, if you're working on this one, you could have exposed parts to your back. And so depending on your voltage that you're dealing with, anything up to 150 volts, is just always three feet. We want three feet clearance. Uh, when you get up to the higher, which would be our 208 or our 480 volts services or anything that's three phase will fall in the, the bottom line. Uh, you can see you can go three, three and a half, and four feet here. Okay, so one thing to keep in mind or to remember, and most people don't realize this, is when you have concrete, which is common the case, commonly the case on the other wall. Uh, technically, as the code, as far as the code is concerned, that's considered a grounded part. It's not an insulated material. Now, concrete is not a great conductor, but it technically will conduct electricity, especially depending on the amount of moisture that might be associated with it. <clears throat> so for National Electrical Code purposes, it falls in this condition too. So, you know, just keep that in mind. The only time that might change things for you a little bit is if you're down in this 151 to 600 volt range, you need, instead of three feet, you're going to need three and a half feet clearance. So this is a common detail that I usually include on my plans that kind of spells that out uh, for people. And, you know, in front of panels, you're going to need at least 30 inches wide. And then you're going to need this clearance based on the table I just told you, how far out. And then code also says that it has to be uh, exclusively dedicated space below the panel and then clear to structure. So that means all the way to the roof deck. Uh, you can't run any piping through that area or, or any uh, duct work or anything like that. So, you know, you just need to keep that in mind as you're coordinating your projects with other disciplines that you have to have these dedicated spaces for electrical equipment and panel boards. So the last thing I just want to touch on here is uh, if you're dealing with switchboards, then you fall into a little bit different category. And so we're looking at here is anything that's rated 1200 amps or more. And so that would usually be a switchboard, the smallest switchboard you could get. You can get panel boards sometimes that large, but uh, this usually comes into play in main electrical rooms with the switchboard. And if the gear lineup is over six feet in width, six feet or more. So if it's six feet or more, according to the code 11026C2, uh, says that we have to have two entrances, you know, if we want to maintain just the original workspace. Okay. Um, if the equipment, again, if we have the same condition and the doors are less than 25 feet from the nearest edge uh, of the space, of the clearance space, then they must open in the direction of egress and they must have panic hardware. I usually just say on my plans and inform my designers that if it's 1200 amps, six, six feet or more, I want that regardless if they're within 25 feet or not. The reason for that is if there is an incident, you know, where something arcs or something flashes or burns up and the electrician or whoever's working on it, you know, gets burned and burns their hands, that way they can make it to the egress door and open it and get out without having to use their hands, right? So it just kind of makes sense. So there is a special condition if you just can't get that second door uh, and you, you 
you want to still, you know, utilize this, this scenario, 1200 amps over six feet, then the code does have an allowance that you can double the clearance in front of it. So instead of three and a half feet, in this case, we would need seven feet total. So we'd have to double it. And the other condition is that the door itself uh, can't be within this three and a half foot uh, radius of any part of the gear. So, you know, you couldn't have a door in this red area at all, right? Uh, within the three and a half feet of the space. So you have to, uh, you have to get out of that space, right? So in the blue space, we'd be okay to have a door in the red space. We're not. So just as you're designing buildings and you're going to have a main electrical room, you know, you need to be aware of what size switch gear you're going to have in there. And with that, you know, you'll want to uh, give allowance for the space needed, either an, an egress pass, either two doors or one door with double the clearance. So, you know, just keep that in mind uh, as we move forward.